So good afternoon or good morning, depending on what part of the world uh, you're in. This is the fifth session of Prophets, Priests, and Prompt Engineers here on ChurchX, and I'm glad to have Andrew and Marco here with me this afternoon, this morning for them, uh, as we're getting off into another exciting exploration, this time looking at a theology of artificial intelligence. AI is one of those things. I, I, I think back to um, to like the turn of the century, which is a weird thing to get to say about 1999. Uh, and the, the idea in in the Matrix, when when Morpheus talks about uh, all of humanity coming together to celebrate the dawning of artificial intelligence, it's oftentimes hailed as like the pinnacle of human innovation. Um, but it's this incredible intersection of technology and ethics and because we're church people living in church land, we want to talk about it theologically as well. So there's a theological element that comes to play into all of this. As we're looking into a complex topic like this today, we're going to look at a couple of questions that are going to challenge our understanding about creation, about humanity, and about even maybe divine involvement in the digital age. So I'm going to be looking at this, this conversation I've structured it into three distinct parts, and each one has its own particular unique insight into the theological implications of artificial intelligence. First off is the section that I'm calling Babel after the tower in Mesopotamia. Uh, in this segment, we're gonna be looking at whether AI is a great leap forward or a dangerous hubris. Uh, we'll be looking at the ethical considerations and the theological reflections around artificial intelligence. And there had been some conversation um, over the last couple of days or the, the other week uh, in the forum conversations uh, around whether AI is something that we need as a society, we need to sort of step back from a little bit, whether we, there needs to be more, uh, whether there needs to be more governmental oversight and control, whether we need to be, whether there needs to be a moratorium on future AI development until we can figure out what exactly we're doing with this, uh, with this thing. We'll look at whether, whether AI, is it a fundamental leap forward for humanity, or if it's this perilous expression of hubris as we seek to become like divine in our own way, are we creating new people, new entities? What does, what does that even look like? Uh, if we're doing this artificially, and where does the artificial and where does the real reality come into uh, come into play as well? Second time is the second part of the conversation that I'm thinking about is uh, what I've called the body of Christ, uh, and this is the sort of church connections. And when we start talking about AI, particularly as we're using as as we've been using it in the church or as we're contemplating using it in the church, there's the questions around. What do relationships look like once AI starts coming into the uh, uh, in, in, into the picture? Um, and Andrew, just before we started, Andrew was started talking about um, a, a group viewing that he'd had uh, in, in in their circumstances, looking at the movie Her with Joaquin Phoenix, and I want to say Scarlett Johansson is the voice of the uh, uh, the voice of the operating system, isn't it? There's a man who falls in love with his uh, with his with his AI. Uh, which is kind of fascinating. And how does that how does that work? Do the the relationships between artificial intelligence and to a, to a lesser degree, even social media, how do these affect human connections? How do the, the how do the technological advances that we've been making over the last few years, how do they shape, uh, build or even tear apart the dynamics of community and social bonds? Um, how are the ways, what are the ways that technology is a good thing for us and what are the ways that it's not so good and something that we need to be a little bit more cautious of. Finally, then the creation side of, uh, side of things. What is a self? How do AI technologies challenge and enhance our traditional conceptions of creation, personhood, and divine involvement? If only God can create life and we procreate, we carry on uh, working in something new that God has already created. We're looking at this idea, what, is, what does identity mean? What does personhood mean in the age of artificial intelligence? If a computer can think for itself, if a computer has uh, a sense of, can a computer develop a sense of self? This is the sort of thing that once, not all that long ago, would have been considered real science fiction type stuff. 
there's plenty of Star Trek episodes with just this kind of uh, just this kind of question that comes into comes into play. But how does AI challenge our understandings of creation? How does it you know how do, how do we need to reevaluate some maybe some of the age old theological concepts in light of technological advancement? If the I I and I'll think about that actually you know what I'll save this uh, I'll save this jumping off point for a little bit further down the road when we get into that uh, uh, into that conversation because I've got a uh, I've got I've got an interesting you know train of thought around whether you even need to say please and thank you to uh, uh, to Chat GPT uh, and there's worthwhile things to, uh, uh, to to dig in on that um, so it's a small group that we've got but I'm that doesn't that doesn't hold me back at all we're just looking for you know. Uh, participation insights from either of uh, uh, either of Andrew or Marco. Uh, feel free to jump in at any point that you uh, that you want. These sessions are less about me telling you all the things that I know, and more about as a community, sort of building things together and and and, and working working forward from there. So let's take a look at um, at what we need to say about uh, about the Tower of Babel, about the body of Christ, about creation, uh, and how AI maybe changes the game or gives us new uh, new rules that we need to start start taking into account uh, when we're when, when we're playing with with things like that. Is it how do you guys feel about about the leap forwards, the, the leaps forward that we have suddenly been making? Uh, in terms of generative uh, AI, in terms of what some people have called uh, the plagiarism machine, uh, image generation, the machine learning, what uh, uh, what what are your thoughts? Is this uh, is this a morally neutral development? Is it something that we need to be cautious of? Is it exciting? What 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 are the first thoughts that come into uh, come into head when 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 we start thinking about what AI means for us in a ethical moral side of things Marco yeah I I um I'm kind of late to the party regarding these um sessions uh I watched a few online and I don't know if that's has it has been discussed earlier in earlier sessions however the way I see it is AI is just like fire or money in the sense that it's what you do with it that makes it damaging or profitable or neutral. Mm -hmm. um, fire can warm you up and it can kill you. Um, and money is, people say money is evil. Money is not evil. If you give money into an evil person, you see what happened, they become president. But that's another, dis that's another discussion. <laughs> uh, did I say that? I didn't hear it. <laughs> So I believe that uh, uh, it is what we use it for that will make it either good or bad or neutral. Is my point of view so far. Um, but there certainly need to have some regulations around it, just like there's regulations around uh, many other things when technology comes um into play, especially when it comes to social media, we need to have some boundaries and it needs to be implemented by um, authority, authorities such as government and whatnot. Hmm. Uh, well, off the top, of my, I, I'm excited about this. Um, I, in the liturgy for this Sunday, I, I do have a prayer where I cited from chat GBT. So it's part of the, the, the worship service. I, I, I'm excited how the congregation, when they see chat GBT, it wrote this prayer. It wasn't me. Um, I said, I looking at it as a tool, part of our, like last night, um, uh, when we talking about AI, I, I, from a, a Google search. So I could, uh, used a technology nowhere in scripture is a tool or a technology condemned for being evil but as pastor marco just said uh even if a tool was designed for evil the tool itself isn't evil uh what is sinful isn't the sword but how people choose to use it so there yeah i can see fear there'll be some people who use it for unscrupulous means um but not everyone. 
Um, it, this can be something positive help. Uh, I think he, he used to be the minister at, um, uh, what was it, in, in Yellowknife, in um, Yellowknife United Church. I, I forget his name, Jonathan. He's He's been on here. Peter, mm -hmm. that's it, Peter. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I think he mentioned that there were, in some of the remote communities, some lay worship leaders are using chat sheet to help them with the liturgy. So there's already something positive uh, from this. Um uh, a, a point when I think we did AI and ethics, uh, I know for clergy, uh, I'm, am I, Jonathan, are you also ordained clergy? Am I? I am. Correct? Yep. Okay. Yeah, we have um, the UCC code of ethics that governs our behavior. Um, I, 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 there, I don't know of any, we talked about there's no public AI code of ethics. I'm not sure who developed that. <laughs> <laughs> um, but um, yes, that their fear is palpable and it's real. Um, I'm excited. I want to continue to learn. No, I, I do. I'm, I want to continue to learn about this. I think, I mean, if I can, if I can pull it back to the, you know, the Tower of Babel um, metaphor that I, uh, uh, that, that I started out. I mean, I guess the idea is even to, while, these people in the very, very early days of Genesis are building this tower. The technology of building towers out of bricks, um, bricklaying, and that and that work is, I mean, is a fundamental human. Uh, it's a fundamental human technology, and it's not the building bricks of it uh, in and of itself. Building lasting houses and not uh, and not tents that you need to pull down and uh, and, and move and are uh, much more vulnerable to attack and elements and all those and all those sorts of things. But the idea of what are we going to do with it, uh, and I think that sort of that that ties into both of y'all's comments um, so far. That it's not that it's it's a tool, but what is the tool for, and how can you use it in ways that are um, that are reasonable and that are going to be life affirming, that are going to be uh, for the good of society and not for the sake of uh, is it is it just a question of uh, when we make learning easier, when we make content creation easier, does that make uh, does that does that make for a world that is uh, cheaper and faster and lazier, or does it give us are are, are are there are there opportunities for growth that 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 comes with that? One of the things because I have a teenage daughter who is beside herself that everything that she does in, in high school now has to be handwritten and has to be you know, presented in because that's that's the only way that the teachers can come up with for ways of, uh, of, of figuring that the students are not actually using AI to uh, uh, AI to cheat. Um, and I keep saying that there's there have got to be ways that there have got to be ways that as a society we can uh, we can put the kinds of uh, the kind of controls that put you know reasonable ex expectations uh, around AI use in in place that it actually helps people and not um, th and and is not always naturally assumed to be uh, a tool for cheating or plagiarism and uh, and things like that. The fascinating thing um, last year, my daughter and my nephew were talking about how in school there is a shift away that even teachers are telling people it's not against you know, it's not necessarily against the rules to look to wikipedia when you're uh, uh, when when you're doing research but to recognize what the uh, what the limitations of wikipedia are where it is where it's reliable and how you can use it as a jumping off point rather than a uh, rather than a source in and of itself um and that is miles ahead of where it used to be that you know that teachers would say don't accept anything that comes from uh, that comes from wikipedia because it's all because it's all naturally suspect um and so that's that's the kind of thing that i would like to see with uh with with ai is not an is not an automatic well if it's a computer it must be good or if it's a computer it must be uh, um it, it must be wicked it can't be can't possibly be as good as the real uh, uh, as the real thing um like we've said there are churches that are using uh that are using ai as a tool to help um help in some uh in some cases of lay leadership where lay people might not have the sense of uh the sense of confidence uh in their own work uh but they can use it to they can use they can use ai to supplement their uh, 
um, their liturgical developments, their, uh, their their theological reflections and things like that. It's not uh, it's it's not the end of the world. I remember. Do you remember like years back? There was a point where there were like uh, there were church signs that used to go up with you know horrible little things about you know God has all the answers, Google doesn't, and uh, and, and nonsense like uh, nonsense like that. These days, I mean, Google for what it's worth, Google or Bing or whatever search engine you're you're looking at, there is an idea that anything that you want to know, you can find if you uh, if if you know how to use the uh, know how to use the tools. And I would like to think that with with proper engagement, AI can work on exactly the same kind of uh, those same kind of levels. So, what kind of ethical guidelines do you think need to be in place for this to be um, a natural human development and you know part of part of our own progress as a species, as the creation of God, and not our own wildly hubristic? What's going to destroy the world? Uh, Jonathan, I, I, I'm going to again answer that question with your example of Tower of Babel. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm thinking of the construction, so construction site. Um, mm -hmm. What would I definitely think would uh, work to sway the fear and the anxiety just within my own congregation, the people, like our conversation last night, is there, could there be some sort of like a labor relations board, um, which which will govern a construction site, uh, building materials, safety uh, equipment being uh, utilized, um, used for AI. Is uh, there a wide, diverse range of people inputting information into AI? Is it, or is this the 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 cloud that the AI is drawing answers from? Is it predominantly from people just Western Europe? Canada, United States, or is there a good representation from Africa, uh, South America, East Asia? Um, you, you get more, you'll get better answers with a, a, a more greater diverse population that AI is giving. So that's, that's just one idea popped into my head. What, make, what you're saying is what make, what come to mind, what comes to mind right now regarding what you just said, Andrew, is is AI white? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> yes. Is it right? Like, is AI white and speak English? Yeah. Yes. Yes. Yeah, you're right. Um, yeah. I, I, how? Okay. Um, 2025 coming next year. Intercultural church goal of the United Church of Canada. I. I me, I'm personally excited about it. Um, I, I would, it would be great to see. I don't know the algorithms of AI. I'm also excited. About, you don't know intercultural, and yeah, just trying to get the whole global community, um, all different because of different, very different opinions. Yeah, well, I am, I am the, the intercultural in the church. And uh, and uh, like I, I'm white, obviously, uh, but still I'm different than I'm not uh, English speaking or. And. Um, I wonder if I mean, I think that the I think that the bias that's going to come into play. Excuse me, with uh, with A.I is that these large language models are either going to scrape everything they can possibly find, just let them loose on the internet, which can be a pretty toxic place on uh, on, on times. Uh, and whether it just gets the pers whether it just gets the perspectives of people who are already um, sharing their own views, putting their own perspectives into uh, into into articles, blogs, Twitter, the whole, Sorry, X, uh, the whole uh, the whole gamut of, of of online communication, or alternatively, that somebody is making specific choices as to what material is going to be used to train the uh, to train the large language module model, 
And if that's the case, well, who is deciding who is doing the programming? Are we just letting the thing uh, pick and choose from whatever is wild and crazy out there? I don't know if either of you have kids, but the idea that uh, the idea that we're putting uh, we're, we're giving kids these days access to all the you know all the riches and all the toxicity of the internet all in one uh, all in one place without any kind of thought as to how to select or censor or to or, or or to to filter through what's good how how do we you know we think about how we teach uh how we teach people to separate the noise from the signal uh in the uh, in, in in the online realm and how much does you know how much does the AI have an opportunity to do uh, to do just that if a large language model is trained on predominantly white middle class uh straight however we you know male whatever what whatever kind of majority lines uh are are, are, are at play uh that that doesn't necessarily speak to any number of minority groups but on the but on the other hand, it may not even be a conscious bias. There can be what it's going to find is it's going to find the kinds of things from people who are already online, from material that is already available, uh, uh, that, that that's already available in that in, in that sense. And how do we take you know how would we make uh, make make a point of including diverse voices in there of hearing cultural uh, cultural uh, perspectives that we wouldn't ordinarily get. In some ways, this could be a really fascinating thing. And I think that we may have touched on this at some point in the past. The idea, I, I think it was last last month when we were talking about um, AI and pastoral care, the idea that that a large language model that that uh, that these kinds of uh, these kinds of technologies could be used to help people get a sense of what it means uh, to be a black woman growing up in Michigan or you know or 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 or, or, or something that is completely foreign to, uh, to to my perspective uh getting getting indigenous perspectives if the model was properly trained to uh, uh, to do that and to recognize this is what somebody who does not look and think like me um how how, how do they think maybe this is a as good a time as any to to shift into the second side of things the second conversation uh around thinking about the church as the body of christ the idea that as uh that as a community we are uh as andrew said we should be looking at a broader you know what, what was the line for 2025 I'm, I'm not united church so i don't get that uh, intercultural uh, church intercultural church in some ways how can we not be moving towards that if we're uh, if, if if we want to live in the 21st century so what could what could ai do or what could ai do to 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 move a goal like that forward and are there ways that it could be actually holding us back uh from an inter from a properly intercultural church you, you i believe in um <clears throat> In one of these sessions, it was mentioned that um, you, you AI is basically is copying or mimicking our behavior. Mm -hmm. And I think an example of Amazon. Don't quote me. I think it was Amazon um, sifting through uh, resumes, and and they discovered that through the AI model they modeled um on mostly men <laughs> were chosen and not as much minorities and women at least that's what i recall from that uh, either conversation or that video now in order to be intercultural it as i understand it it will have to be purposeful because if we look at the united church of canada as it stands right now it's not very multicultural it tends to be, it wants to be, but it's not. If you go into congregations, it's white and it speaks, people speak English. Then if, then we would have to be purposeful into moving into what it means to be intercultural and that will have to be human input, not AI generated, if that makes sense. Yeah. 
That's what comes to mind right now. <clears throat> Yeah, I can just, um, yeah, uh, one interesting, you may find food. Okay, you might find this example funny. Um, <laughs> okay, I really like samosas. Uh, I, I know a traditional food from the UCW is egg salad sandwiches. Okay, I, <laughs> I, I, I've, had, I've had lots of egg salad sandwiches when I was, uh, what, seven, eight, nine, ten. I, I, I don't want to have any more egg salad sandwiches. Um, when I arrived to Kamloops from, from Woodstock, Ontario, I, I went to Pita Land Kamloops. The owner is Lebanese. There's two employees from Iraq. Uh, I brought hummus, baba ganoush, falafel. Kamloops United Church had never had this kind of food before. And I said, folks, this is part of intercultural church. Um, so what Pastor Marco said, it's going to take human input. Yeah, it's going to take the clergy and the members of the United Church as it is today to introduce intercultural church, whether it be through food, music, liturgy. Uh, I just started with food. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, and, and I guess some positive news, uh, all the hummus and falafel, it was all finished by the congregation. So they <laughs> like. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, it, in my church, it goes as ethnic as um, Ukrainian um, food. That's it. <laughs> and they call that intercultural or multicultural. <laughs> my 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 wife would make my my wife would make cream cheese and cherry sandwiches as opposed to just the egg salad sandwiches <laughs> and. And that was a Nova Scotia thing. Nova Scotia to Newfoundland. That's the yeah, you know, that's the intercultural <laughs> that, that, that we've had sometimes. So what but but thinking about so we have this, you know, we we are now more connected than ever before. And yet at the same time, we seem to be more and more divided. Um we have we have the tools to find out just about anything that we want to know we can get recipes we can we don't have to go out to get we can we, we can get the we can get the recipes for pitas and 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 uh, and, and 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 falafel and the whole the whole works but somehow there's there's still something that kind of holds us back that we're comfortable with what we have how are there are there ways that are there ways that we can think about um about about ai um, even helping to make a more cross-cultural experience, it's going to need it's it's going to take human uh, human input. Uh, but what does it what what does it even look like? What does how can AI actually help us with uh, developing relationships between each other, between from one culture to another? Are there are there ways that we can that that, that we can work with that? Mm. Just to go back to your analogy of the Tower of Babel, you call it? Yeah. Yep. Okay. I, I mean, I should say you pronounce it. I know what it is, but um, yeah. I, I know the word in different languages. The end result in some ways and in some uh, aspect was division. Yep. Um. And, and AI can can be that thing as well where we um when when it comes to language and i've learned that just because english is my third language i understand that when you talk words have a psychological emotion attached to it and that attachment is personal to me so if I say, I'm going to make a generalization, God loves me like my father loves me. Well, if my father was abusive and his love was uh, conditional, then I see God the same way and attach love, the word love, as, okay, something is expected out of me. Somebody else will ex will um, interpret the word love differently regarding their own circumstances and life uh, experiences. And uh, to an extent, I wonder if it's the same thing with AI. 
uh, even just considering AI in itself, some people see it as um, um, a big beast that will take over and don't want to touch it. Just like people 20 years ago didn't want to get into social media. Mm -hmm. uh, then we see that same reluctance now when it comes to AI. And I said to the congregation a few weeks ago, because I made a video where the voice was AI, the video was AI. I made it on, in, it was basically the scripture reading and uh, nobody noticed that it was mm. basically a robot. And I said, AI is here to stay. It's how we use it that will make a difference. And um, yeah, so I'm digressing, sorry. I, mm. I think about the fact that two stories that come into my mind, one of them was uh, I had I had to call Air Canada at one point last fall to adjust. Uh, there was a boarding pass that didn't come through into my you know, into my app, and I had to I had to negotiate uh, the automated systems, you know, help us direct your call and, uh, and all those sorts of things. Uh, and it was, and I was talking to, I'm pretty darn sure that it was a uh, yeah, very the most sophisticated AI chatbot that I had ever uh, that I'd ever come across. Uh, that the system asked me what you know what do you need help with I said this he said okay it sounds like you're looking for help with your with your with your boarding pass is this right and and, and all that and I, and I and I you know I got through and I was talking to eventually I was talking to uh, uh, to a human agent and she was you know sorted out all the problems that I needed to and I said I have got to say I have never heard any I have never talked to a computer that sounded so realistic and so lifelike she said, you're not the first person to say that, she said, but that's actually a real guy. And I said, what? And she said, no, I'm just kidding with you. That's, a... <laughs> but that, but that, that idea that, uh, that idea that the, the recorded voices on the phone uh, can be, can be immediately off-putting for some people that as soon as, uh, and I think particularly of older people who will think about it and say, I don't understand how to, you know, when to push one, when to push three, all, all of that. I want to talk to, I want to talk to a person. And the other side of that story was a point a little while back when I had a, uh, I had a phone call from some telemarketer who launched right into her spiel so, you know, so quickly that I just assumed that she was a recording. And I said, I'm not going to talk to, I'm not just going to listen to this whole recorded message. She said, and she started to laugh. She said, you think I'm a recording? And I said, oh, I said, I'm really sorry. You didn't sound very human to me. And, the, but the idea is, I, I think the, the idea in both of those stories is that sometimes we can react differently to people if we're, if we think that we're talking to a recording, if we think that we're talking to a machine and how do we, uh, I think about, um, my father is my father is enough of a curmudgeon uh, that he loves to uh, he loves to ask the smart home speakers in our house questions that it can't really end, that, 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 that it doesn't really understand how to how, how to answer uh, and then to laugh at the you know, at the speaker that you know there's a lot of things that Google doesn't know and and all that. and I remember trying to I remember the, the the suggestion a conversation we had at one point about at what point is it uh, at what point is it reasonable to say please and thank you to uh, to the computer when we're when when we're talking to it? Because if you wouldn't talk to another person like that, why is it okay to talk to uh, why is it okay to talk to the computer? And I wonder if that actually ties into the way that people can be so horrifically abusive on social media because they've lost the sense that they're necessarily talking to another person. They're, you know, they they feel like they're safe behind the anonymity of of, of the computer screen. Uh, that the things that you can say and the you know and the rage and the outrage that comes into that comes into play when emotions start to run high, if you can vent at a computer in the same way that uh, um, uh, in the same way that you would be embarrassed to do that to real people, I wonder how much is that going to affect the ways that we interact with each other in real life. Mm. Jonathan, I, I like that you can't see a person. So it you're in a chat box and may just you be easier to be abusive. But right now we can all say like, Pastor Marco, I see Jonathan human. Yeah. But if it's just a box, it may yeah, and, and mm. 
I don't know. I, I don't know, but yeah, it's got me thinking. Yes. <laughs> I mean, I made a point of, of of changing the voice on my uh, on on my Google Assistant, uh, so it's a male presenting voice, because I didn't want my daughter to get the message that it's okay for me to boss around uh, people with female sounding voices and uh, and things like that, and that if I'm going to be, you know, if if I sometimes I lose my patience with the speaker when it doesn't always understand what I'm what what I'm talking about at first, and so at least I can be, you know, yelling at another man instead of yelling at a woman. <laughs> Uh -huh. but, it's, John, but, it's, it's, but it's a conscious decision and it's you know and it's the way that we say please and thank you uh as much as we can uh to the smart technology in our house uh because that's while it's weird to talk to machines as if they were people uh it's what keeps us from talking to people as if they were machines hmm. Jonathan, I just thought of, I had a good uh, a con where you just said male, female voice. Um, Ask me that. Was my Google assistant, was it a male or female voice? I thought I'd have some fun. I said it's neither. I said it's a non-binary voice. Um, that works too. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, that, uh, but th that's another thing I think where human input could could teach about uh, well United Church of Canada it's important it's challenge I, for my previous congregation was affirming church they didn't the church didn't want to do it because they said oh we're already welcoming Andrew okay <laughs> the current church where I am it's been affirming since 1996 uh, but yeah they're both United Church of Canada parishes just one is much more embraced a pie public, intentional, explicit. Um, so yeah, I, that when you said the male, female voice that triggered that conversation I had. Um, yeah, I, I don't, yeah, how, how, how does Siri and Hey Google and Alexa feel about it? I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> um, I don't know if you just heard, but uh, when I said, I don't know, uh, Siri in my uh, bedroom just chimed in. <laughs> So uh, that's another good example of AI. They're always listening. <laughs> yeah, they're always listening. I have Google here, and uh, sometimes I will ask her something in English, and she will answer me in French. <laughs> and sometimes I will ask her something in French, and she will say in English, I don't understand. Was I like it? <laughs> That is the one thing I have frustrations when it comes to AI. Yeah. I was actually, I actually remember reading an article a few years ago about how the rise of smart speakers and Google Assistant and Siri and, and all of the sort of voice recognition that comes into, uh, that comes into play. One of the things is that it's actually doing away with a certain amount of regional accents. Because if your accent is too strong one way or the other, or not what the uh, not what the system is expecting to hear, uh, then it will be more difficult to get to get Siri to play whatever music you're suggesting or uh, on, on, on all of that. Um, that you almost need to talk like the person who has programmed the voice recognition uh, to get the best uh, to get the <clears throat> best results, and that it is kind of flattening out everyone's accents so that we're all becoming much more um uh, much more homogenous which again kind of comes back to that uh, um maybe it's the other side of the tower of babel babel that uh, uh well we're you know instead of all speaking in different tongues we're all speaking you know, the same way because it's the only way to get the smart speakers to listen to us <laughs> yeah and like we were talking about is ai intercultural or multicultural, and um, I couldn't use the voice recognition for a long time because they could not recognize my accent and they would always mm -hmm. give me the wrong information I was asking. Now it, like, I don't have the same problems anymore. I don't know if I'm losing my accent and I'm more international when I speak English, which I doubt, but it seems to be the technology is more on point now that it recognizes my my accent when I speak. Hmm. <clears throat> but you, you were talking about the Holy Spirit. 
Uh, yeah, I mean, um, um, Christ earlier, uh, Jonathan, the body of Christ. Yeah. And your question, what exactly, because it, it, it kind of triggered something in me, like, and I want you to tell me more or maybe tell us more about what you meant by that. Because I find that very interesting, being the body of Christ and AI. Well, I, I've been thinking about it in terms of the, the I mean, the, the body of Christ is, is one of the standard images that we use for thinking about our relationship with each other, our relationship with God through Christ. Uh, so what does it look like? Can, can a non-corporeal entity, if we're going to assume that, uh, that, you know, that AI could have uh, a sense of self, if there was such a thing as a, uh, as, you know, as, as, as a true artificial intelligence that thinks for itself, that has its own, uh, its own sense of consciousness, can, if it doesn't have a body, can it belong to the church in a way that, uh, you know, in the same way uh, that you and I can as, uh, as human beings? Um, would there be such a thing as digital baptism can you baptize an ai does it have a you know does, does it have a sense does it have a does it have a soul um i would look on a similar set of analogy i would think that like my dog has some kind of a rudimentary soul that doesn't work exactly the same way as mine but we would never consider you know can the dog be a church warden or a parish treasurer or something uh, or something like that can a dog be ordained no because the dog doesn't you know the dog doesn't belong to the body of christ in the same way that uh, in the same way that a human being can so what does it look like if we're more and more uh if if we turn over some of these roles um in terms of preaching and content creation and pastoral care, if we're able to do some of these things with a tool, where does the tool stop and where does the where does where does the self begin? I, does that I wonder, I like I'm I'm gonna answer with a question. I Go guess. for it. Yep. Does AI have spiritual needs? Does mm. AI have a spiritual life? <clears throat> Yeah. That is my question. Yeah. Because if, if you say if you say let's ordain an AI, well then what is the AI of spiritual practices, for example? Um what is their spiritual need? Um I mean, I could make up some, I could make up some, I think it's an excellent question. I could make up, you know, I could make up some really clever ideas, you know, ideas and answers on, on all that. And like to a certain point, I would say if, uh, if an AI is going to be speaking with any kind of an authority or, you know, if the AI, you know, the UCC AI or uh, Anglican AI or whatever the, whatever, whatever the technology, whatever we're, we're looking at, if that's going to be a source of um, a, a you know a source of authority in a congregation or in a community, then somebody needs to be able to say yes, this is speaking you know on 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 on, on our behalf. Um, it's actually kind of like what the you know, what what the uh, religious leaders are asking Jesus in uh, in in this Sunday's gospel from the uh, Revised Common Lectionary. By what authority are you doing these things? Uh, that somebody needs to say. Uh, that yes, this AI is speaking on behalf of the community and on, on all of that. And that would be on one level, part of what ordaining an AI would look like is to say, uh, this has this has the community's uh, 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 has, has the community's authority and and, uh, and and speaks on our behalf like that. Uh, I would look at, I mean, I could say that you know spiritual practice, uh, for for an AI could be that sort of constant Bible study and uh, and digging in. I can I, I can make up ideas on 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 how that on, on how that looks, but there is that sort of question of is is that then just mimicking what humans do, or is it responding to an actual spiritual need that the that the system has? Um just because 
just because spiritual needs and what what is it that what is it that the AI wants or needs? Um, probably there's an easy answer that's like more information, you know, like a like like constantly consuming um, more information. Tell me more. Tell me more. Tell me more. But I don't know how that turns into um, how might an AI think about what it is that it wants. Does an AI recognize that you know enough is enough, or that if I take in too much information all at one go, I'm going to be overloaded in, in the same way that uh, that if we take in too much information, there's an information overload that we can't process the information that we're thinking. Um, but then again, AI's got you know probably better processing power than we do. Can you know <laughs> can 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 multitask in ways that uh, uh, in, in in ways that we can. So what what kind of spiritual needs? would an AI have? And then there also comes the question of if uh, if if an AI can be a contributing and can be can be a, 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 a member of the body of Christ um, and we're not responding to its spiritual needs, what does that say about, you know, <laughs> about 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 being a member of the body of Christ? Mm. I, I like that, uh, like pastoral care. How yeah. do we, how do we pastor to the to the AI entity? Um, Siri, hey Google, yeah. Um, I also, when you were talking, Jonathan, I had an image in my head. I'd like to do that for the 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 face study of just one hour from now. I'd like to bring in my HomePod Siri and just plug it in and make it part of the group and see what happens. <laughs> Yeah, it is. Yeah, that that's true. Because I, I have a prayer from Chat GBT. I um I'm gonna this Sunday, but to have Siri there and in, in the HomePod form as part of the the Bible study, we could ask uh, ask it a question. Um, yeah, what does that mean, uh, Pastor Marco? One thing I did for my covenanting service when I use symbols, um, I had an app on my phone. Uh, faith match i have fun with it um it's just a game uh, but i i probably i use that to say that jesus is present in all spaces including cyberspace so yeah that's a good um ai is part of the body of christ well yeah what does that mean uh, yeah i'm fascinated with it, it, it I'm such an introvert. I have to think about everything before Instagram. <laughs> <laughs> and being I, I, French Canadian, like you have to be, like you have to talk on top of one another. And uh, um, yeah, these conversation, like I, I really enjoyed these, um, these webinars. They make me think. Um, that's an aside, that's a little caveat, but oftentimes the church is really late to the party. Uh, well, and that's and, and, and uh, that's that's part of where where uh, where Tay and I had been, you know, trying to make this uh, trying to make this th this conversation and make these particular webinars happen was largely just so that we can play a little bit of catch up and start that if if the church is not uh if the church is not getting involved in these these kinds of conversations and sometimes it's not even a question of having the right answers sometimes it's just encouraging more questions marco i'm so i'm so grateful to you for that you know that that question about raising you know the needs of you know of of, of ai if we're going to talk about uh if we're going to talk about the idea that AI or the or that or that a computer or the technology could have a soul or a sense of self, then does it have spiritual needs? Um, and are we just creating something that uh, that we're happy to ignore its you know, its its own spiritual needs? Does if the AI if the tool doesn't know good from evil, uh, what can we uh, what what can we do with that? And there's a whole other metaphor that I didn't. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> that we didn't have time to uh, to to dig into. 
however, we're fast running out of time. So I want to thank the both of you for this uh, for this conversation. Some of these conversations can carry over into the uh, into the forum. Uh, I'd be you know happy to talk more on that kind of uh, that kind of thing and exploring that notion of what does um, what are the kinds of questions that we need to be thinking about if we're thinking theologically about artificial intelligence and not just in a practical side of uh, side of things? Maybe these are some of the conversations that actually tend to lend themselves uh, towards introverts like you and like me, but the uh, uh, that you know ha having time to sit and think and ruminate on it and and uh, and play, I'd be happy to see more conversations coming up on all of that. Uh, this is the kind of timely reminder. Oh gosh, I'm thinking about next month. Uh, we are looking at, uh, we would be scheduled to meet on the 27th, which is smack dab into the middle of Holy Week. And I suspect that if you're anything like me, Holy Week is the last kind of time that you want to uh, uh, be, be blocking things up. I'm going to put a poll out into the uh, into the group. I suspect that we will probably meet the week before on the twenty on the twentieth of uh, of March, uh, so we'll uh, uh, I'll make a make make a call on that uh, within the next week or two because I know that uh, uh, the time leading up to Easter comes comes quickly. Yeah, I just wanted to say, well, I'll answer the poll. I'll I will favor the twentieth as opposed to the twenty seventh. I wanted to tell you in person that uh, on the twenty seventh, I'm leading. Uh, service at long-term care and the manor here in town, so I will not be able to be here. But if it's on the twentieth, I'm I would uh, I would love I, I will answer you at the poll and yeah. choose. That uh, and I think that I think that what I'm looking at here now is whether it's whether we <laughs> want to meet the week before or the week after, uh, and, uh, and and how all that goes. But yeah, we'll see how that uh, we'll, we'll we'll see where that goes. I suspect that uh, I suspect that Wednesday and Holy Week is going to be a terrible time for. Uh, for 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 people to do much of anything, but we do have a uh, but I do have a topic for next month, uh, and we can start thinking about that. And over some time, I'll put some uh, uh, questions for consideration out. Uh, what happens when we start thinking about artificial intelligence and social justice, um, which is an interesting uh, uh, interesting twist, and where we'll go with that. Uh, so I want to thank you all. Thank you both for being a part of this conversation today. This video will be uh, will be saved, will be uh, tweaked and edited, and we'll throw it up uh, onto the uh, uh, in, into the ChurchX uh, course page uh, along with the AI summary and see how that uh, see how that all plays out. Until next time, be good, stay safe. We'll talk to you. Thank you, Jonathan and Pastor Marco. Blessings. Thanks to you both.